Um, my name is Chris McGowan. Today we're going to talk about um, kind of test automation. Um, so before we start, I just wanted to kind of get an idea of kind of where everyone is at the room with regards to uh, you guys looking for information on um, kind of framework stuff or kind of beginning. We might be all over the place. So this might kind of be a mute question, but just wanted to kind of get a take. Maybe a raise of hands. Are you interested in framework, kind of, kind of more advanced stuff? I have some talks a little bit about that. Or are you interested in sort of like kind of getting going on Selenium, um, that kind of stuff. So Selenium, raise your hand on the first one. OK, so Selenium's good. I've worked mostly in Selenium. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the other frameworks, but I don't have a lot of experience with those. Um, so I want to thank Minibar. This, I, this is my third Minibar, and this is my first time presenting at Minibar. So any comments are helpful if you have. I'll try to talk slow and not like go take too many pauses. But thanks for coming. Um, Becoming a supporter is $100 a year. You don't have to worry about going out and trying to get tickets. So it's a really great way to support your, uh, your community here. Um, these are, I don't know if I'm going to do this, but one thing to think about is the really software automation is really to improve the quality of your product, whatever it is, right? So these are kind of some things people talk about. So, um, What's your current test infrastructure? Are you doing nightly builds? Automated regression, which is what we're going to talk about today a little bit more. Um, I don't know who this Joel guy is, but he asked a lot of questions with regards to, are, do you have good source control? Um, are you able to build really easily? Things to think about. Um, are you doing daily builds, nightly builds? Do you keep track of your, your, um, your bugs in something like Jira, for example? And... Um, do you have specifications for your software? Uh, quality of development, uh, testers, et cetera, et cetera. So some things to think about. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, again, test automation. Um, I'll go through some of the different tools that are available. Selenium mostly, Cucumber, and we'll get into the design part of it a little bit. And I'd like to make it interactive, you know, so if you guys have questions, again, you all have your microphones. We demoed this earlier if you weren't here. Hello. So you can just like push the button and ask me a question. So um, you can tell I like microphones. So so I'm going to take you really quick. Um, so I've I've kind of gone through a weird path. I started out in electrical engineering, and then I was in Berlin, which I got involved in uh, testing for the first time in uh, kind of a hardware area, which I'll show you in a second. And then I got went to Target. And Target was my first experience doing developments outside of testing. But it was my first experience kind of doing live testing. There used to be a Target store in North Minneapolis off Broadway. It's not there anymore. We used to take our software, which we tested a little bit, and we would send it over there to that store, because that store didn't do very well. And we would test it live. Okay, so that was, that was probably not a good example of how to test your software. So then after that, I went to Veritas, which is one of the sponsors of this event. And I worked at Veritas for a period of time. Veritas was my first experience really with a good software process with regards to nightly builds. You know, you check your software in. Every time the software gets checked in, it gets built in a continuous integration environment, which we'll talk about a little bit. And then I moved on to Meteorologics, which was kind of a step backwards. And then uh, in 2010, I got involved at a company, this is in Germany, um, where I got exposed to uh, Selenium. So that was my first experience with Selenium, and I've been kind of doing Selenium development since then. And I'm currently at Thomson Reuters. So that's me, and that's not me. But So I always just like to throw this in there. I lived in Berlin in the 90s, um, and then I lived there again recently. Um, when I was there in the 90s, I was part of an exchange program. So part of the deal that you sign off on is always to expose the United States to the German culture. So Angela Merkel was here momentarily, or momentarily. She was here a while ago. So this is uh, German. Do you guys all remember the Berlin Wall falling down? I was there. It was amazing. That's where I lived. Actually, that's where I lived. It's very sad. But then, this is true, this is what East Berlin looked like in 1990, 1990, OK? And so then what happened was I got a job at Siemens, and I went from that to there. 
Look at that. Isn't that cool? So this is Siemens, and that's where I got involved in testing fiber optic transceivers. Working in an environment like that it was very exciting. These are little fiber optic transceivers. But the point here, which is interesting, is we had these machines in the production line. And what you want to do, the idea with software testing is to find your failures early in the process, right? If, you find the, if your customers are calling you on the phone and saying it's broken, then you failed, right? If, you, if your testers and hopefully your automation is finding these failures early in the cycle when the developers check their code in like right away, then you've saved the company a lot of money. So this process, we had all these machines hooked up to software that was basically collecting data from these guys. Um, and then we would generate, we had Q1, Q2, and 3. So this was the first phase. If we found our failures here, that was really good. Here was okay. And if we found failures here, a lot of money has gone into fabri fabricating these transceivers by that point, right? And we're talking about hardware, but it's the same, basically the same approach. So that was my first kind of experience. There's the economics, talks a little bit about when you find your, your failures at the requirements level versus the architectural level, construction, system test, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so test automation. I'm just looking at my clock. Oh, it's only 207. I'm talking really fast. So, so software, uh, software automation is basically a framework to control your tests. Um, there's different kinds of software automation. We'll talk about some of those today. Um, you're typically separating that software from the actual production software. But in many times, in, in what you want to do, and one of the failures sometimes of automation is you don't give the same design mentality, you don't give the same sort of process to developing that software as you would production software. Um, so some of the different areas, uh, Unit tests, J unit, N unit, <coughs> usually done on the development side. You've got test driven development, which is sometimes difficult to do in practice, which is basically the developers have a task to write A, B, and C, right? And the testers have a task to automate that process. So they start writing A, B, and C. The, hi, Hello. the, um, the developers might not really have their specifications yet, but in the agile process, you move forward, right? So the testers might have their stuff done first and get their tests executing. Well, they'll fail because the developers don't have their stuff done. So once the developers get their stuff done, then magically those tests will pass. That's kind of test-driven development. Um, agile development methodologies make that possible. Um, increasing readability, less costly, higher code coverage, continuous integration process. Um, are these topics that you guys want me to go into a little deeper with regards to continuous integration? I've got some samples at the back end. Jenkins, uh, Maven, um, I don't know. I'm going to wait for you to answer, because I think it should be, I can go around and we can all introduce ourselves, because we have time. So um, some of that is new. If it's not, you know, I heard yes in the background. So continuous integration? Yes. Okay. Yes. So continuous integration is really came about because we can, we can, as developers, you can write software and you can basically deliver it to the customer pretty fast, right? It's just out there. In the old days, I used to write software that was burned to a CD, right? And you did releases every six months. And when it was all done, you burned it all to a CD and you sent it to the customer. And then the customer would use it, right? And we obviously we tested it. But you can't do continuous integration because it's just not possible when you're burning that medium. So nowadays, we can actually have a web page. The customers are looking at our web page. We can write code. And we can basically put that code out there, and they see it. So continuous integration is a process that the developers are writing code. They're checking their code into a version control system like Git or TFS. And TFS has the ability, or Git has the ability, actually it's Jenkins, sorry. There's other tools. We use Jenkins. Jenkins is a tool that monitors the version control system. And we'll talk about this in a little bit. But then when it sees a check-in, then it will actually say, hey, we have code changes. Let's go run some tests. And those are typically your smoke tests. Because 
When you're doing continuous integration, you can't have a test run for hours. You, can only, you just want to kind of check the main, maybe some main REST services that are up, and maybe a, a couple of GUIs to make sure that that stuff's working. So when a developer checks in code, um, there's a message that gets sent, and then uh, the process, the build process happens, which then triggers your smoke tests, which might run under like Selenium, for example. So that's, that's the idea of continuous integration. Um, and then nightly builds, um, typically you would schedule a nightly build and then have that process run a fuller suite of tests. So you might have a suite of tests that runs for a couple hours. We have, suite, we have suites at Thomson Reuters that run for like five hours and some other <laughs> ones that run for, we only run them every couple weeks against just checking data that run for like 10 hours, things like that. So any questions on continuous integration? OK. Um, I wish I had a clock on my screen. So anyway, uh, these are, so this is different types of, that's fine. I'm just kidding. I have my, I have my clock right here. See? It's 2.12. Um, I do need a drink, though. Sorry, this is all my food here, sorry. Um, so, graphical user interface testing. Um, we've got record and playback features. Selenium has a, an IDE, and there's an, a, other frameworks that have record and playback, where you can basically have it learn, sort of learn, um, what you're testing, and then play it back. Not recommended for pr production, I don't think. Um, Driver-based tests, hold on. So driver-based tests, basically, um, Selenium and uh, Selenium and other other frameworks actually talk to an API in the browsers. So this is an interesting topic. Oh, who's that? Sorry. Um, so in the beginning, we're going to kind of jump around. Selenium. There was Selenium version one, which really used JavaScript to make the browser do what it wanted to do. So you could write a script, and it would use JavaScript to push the button or read text off the screen. And then what they've done is they've started working with the browser developers, so Mozilla for Firefox, <laughs> IE, Microsoft, those guys, and said, hey, we need you guys to provide us an API so that we can talk to that API. And um, so Selenium WebDriver is that version. That's Selenium 2.0, I think they call it. And that version, you, you provide the driver, and the driver actually talks to the browser. Now, you, if you've worked with different browsers, you know they behave differently, and they behave differently with different, um, different Selenium versions. So now what they're trying to do, and I'm not exactly sure I was looking at this earlier, Selenium has become part of the W, hold on, I have it on my web page here. Or maybe I don't. There's a, there's, a, there's a web standard. Does anybody know what it's called? It's like W23 or W... Yeah, WC3. So Selenium, and the, the article I read was dated 2015, so this is probably in process still. But Selenium is going to be the standard for all browsers. And the other thing that's happening is that companies that develop the browsers are starting to take on the job of integrating the, the driver for Selenium into their software, okay, which will hopefully in the future, and I think that's Selenium 3.0, which is uh, starting to come out. So this, I just bopped in here. There's a, this link is on this presentation, which I'll put out there someplace. Um, this is a really good website. It has architecture of open source projects. This, this is Selenium WebDriver, but this is a really interesting read. It talks about what they thought about and how they design principles. There's some really interesting dis discussion about what they had to do to make all this stuff work with IE, because you know IE is written with COM and C, C++ and all this crap, right? So it's a really interesting discussion. Um, the link is on this presentation, which will be out, I'm sure, on the website somewhere. Um, so going back here, sorry. How's everyone? Everyone have any questions so far? View. Oh, I'm in open office. I don't want to be in open office. Oh yeah, I do. View, view, view. Slideshow. Okay. Um, 
API-driven testing. Okay, so there's a discussion, and this is our next slide here, uh, about what to test. Okay, so you can test your your web application, which is GUI, but the GUI, a lot of times, the, the graphical user interface is calling to web services, REST services, sometimes SOAP services. Um, so there's a thought that maybe you should spend more time testing those REST services and not as much time testing the UI. So I, that's a discussion at the management level and how much money you have and how much resources you have and how much time and how much risk there is and all that kind of stuff. Um, the companies I've been, and I've only been at Thomson Reuters, except for Mr. Specs in the very beginning, but Thomson Reuters has made the decision to test it all, right? So we, we have a lot of coverage on the UI, but we also have a lot of coverage on the REST services. We test all the REST services independently of the UI. Um, so something to think about. Um, this is, you guys may or may not, this is Mr. Rush, Limbo, and Terry Gross. They both have different opinions, and so it's interesting because this guy, Joe, I can't pronounce his name, Colantino, he's, he's kind of a resource out there. And this was an inter interesting discussion about what to test and when, mostly the discussion I just talked about, whether to test the UI versus the, the server side REST services. Google, or the, the guys that actually wrote Selenium, are quoted as saying, it's better to spend more time at the rest side for whatever reason. So anyway, I'm going to skip over that. So let's so this is the frame this is kind of starting the discussion on the framework. So we are at 217 and when am I done? 250, right? 255. Okay, cool. Um so now we can kind of kind of talk about the framework. Do you guys have any kind of other general questions, sir, in the back? Yeah. So can Selenium be used to test non-web-based applications like uh, you know, it's tools, standalone servers, you know, it's, installation processes. You can use it to test back-end services. It won't test like Windows app. Like if you wrote a Windows app, you know, it won't test that kind of stuff. Um, there are tools that will test that. Um, the other thing that Selenium is doing is they are providing the tools to allow you to test mobile apps, native. So you can test native iOS and Android and Microsoft, I believe. Um, it's hard to read. I can't even read that screen. Oh, I can read it here. So this talks a little bit about test. This is just a general slide on test automation. Um, so you have kind of advisory services, feasibility studies, uh, tool evaluation. This is kind of talking about evaluating when you're going to build a framework or purchase a framework. So some things to think about. And I break those out in a little bit here. Um, so you know, looking at tools, looking at your uh, resources that are available to you, um, and then development and maintenance. Um, one, of the things I, one of the things I've seen over you know, just three or four years is, um, for whatever reason, it's really hard to get people to come in as employees of company and do test automation. A lot of those employees want to move, you know, once they get experience in development, maybe they move on to development, et cetera, et cetera. So what ends up happening is companies will hire contractors, and I'm a contractor, by the way, I didn't mention that. I work for Sojeti, which is a contracting company in the Twin Cities. Um, so. They'll bring people like myself in and build the framework, but then when it's all done, then they, you know, they, we're, we go away and we train the folks that are there. But a lot of times, the money and the resources aren't there to continue to maintain the framework. Because um, I've gone in, a lot of times when we go into positions, like when we went into Thomson Reuters, they had, a, they had like thousands of tests, but the tests were failing because they changed servers, or because they moved to different environments, so they were very, uh, the tests were kind of brittle in the sense. And so what we ended up doing is kind of redesigning their framework a little bit and adding a lot of, um, a, a lot of more reliability, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but that's kind of an area that is important, I think, also to look at. So let's see, so we'll talk about the, we're gonna talk a little bit about framework design. Um, Complex tests, complex frameworks 
make things easier to implement for implementing tests. And I'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, reusable critical components. Um, you're reducing your maintenance costs and support of test automation, adopting and using standards across a whole organization. So one of the things I think the main thing here is when you design a framework, um, it's really important, I think, to get a view of like where it's going to be used and where it could be leveraged in other areas. And uh, this is difficult. I mean, going back to Thomson Reuters, we, we, we actually leveraged an existing framework that I had used in another group, and we brought that framework into our group. And you know, it was out on GitHub, and we could have basically taken those two frameworks and made them sort of public inside of Thomson Reuters. But those guys who had their framework, they didn't want, to, um, want us messing with it. You know? So then, now there's another group. We've implemented our version of that framework. There's this version over here. And now there's this other group that's interested because they heard that this framework is really cool. So now they're thinking of implementing their own because they want to do their own thing. So that's another, it's just kind of a, from an architectural level. It's really important to sort of communicate with other groups because if the framework is designed properly, you actually can leverage other groups and provide reusability um, if it's designed properly um, for components that are common between those groups. Uh, one example of that is at Thomson Reuters, there's a, what's called a, a one pass, which is the common authentication that's used in like, you know, there's Thomson Reuters has like 30 apps, right? All different types of apps. Well, each one of those apps uses this one pass page. So what we did is when we designed our framework, we basically um, provided a, a base class that is for the business and that base class basically has all the components that get reused on all of the other pages. And then, so that base class, I actually have that over there, but we'll talk about it. That base, base class can be extended, and then you have other base classes that provide support for specific groups. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit. I keep saying that, don't I? Test automation framework, well designed, um, clear vision and scope. So we're getting into some of the options. I think I'm going to just kind of cruise through this a little bit. Um, adoption and reuse, ongoing maintenance. We talked about how maintenance is very important. Um, a, a well designed framework is also very important. Um, it provides maintenance, cost considerations. Um, I mean, one thing, so. Going back to Thomson Reuters, so this framework wasn't designed very well, I guess. So they had an architect, and he uh, requested two folks from Sojeti. So Kajiri and I went over there, and we started looking at their framework in like September. So we were there September, October, November, and started implementing first smoke tests to sort of make sure everything was working with our new framework. So we were there for like four months. You know, I kind of did the the math. You know, it's expensive. That that was like. $128,000 to have Gajuri and I there for four months, you know? And so one thing is I think companies have to understand that that's kind of the cost of, of, of basically providing quality to your software. Um, so you guys have any questions so far? We're going to get to the Good stuff in a minute here. Um, evaluate framework. I'm not going to talk too much about buying a framework. Is anybody in the market to buy a framework? Or are you guys mostly writing your own stuff? OK, good. So here's some options. I haven't used, I've only used Selenium and Ranarex. But Robot is a, is a popular framework right now. It's open source. It targets any platform and runs on any platform. Um, uh, APM is is being used to uh, to support Android and iOS. It runs on uh, Windows OS X and Windows. Open source, Ranarex. Anybody done Ranarex? C? No, 
I kind of put that in there as a joke. Actually, my, the architect that I'm working with at Thompson Reuters, you know, he saw I was doing this presentation, and we're chatting, and he's like, you should talk about Ranorex. So Ranorex is a pr proprietary. It's very expensive. It's like, it's like 200, I don't know, $2,400 a year. I think it's a subscription. It's kind of like Selenium. It does actually test... One of you guys in the back wanted to know, it does test everything. It tests Windows apps, it tests mobile apps, it tests everything. So in that sense, but the other thing you got to think about is your support in the community. If you have a problem with Selenium and you Google, like you go out there and you say, I need a problem with this selector, da 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 da, and you Google that, you get tons of support in, on the internet for like help. Ranorex, what ends up happening is if you, if you type something like that, and maybe some of these other frameworks, I'm not sure, um, you, there are certain areas where you can get support, but there's other areas where it's not as robust. So there's Frank, which is kind of a lower end test platform. Has anybody used Frank before? Nope. And then um, QTP, uh, previously, oops, sorry, um, UTF is used quite a bit. I think at a lot of larger companies, it's, it's I don't want to say legacy, and I have never used it, but I know that I've gone into some companies, and I'm, I think I'm about to go into a company that, that where they're using this, and they're having a lot of problems with it, so. Um, and then there's Selenium. So this will, this will be our transition kind of into Selenium and Cucumber, um, the kind of the meat of this discussion. And we're at 2.30, so that's good. Um, so Selenium, again, is it's open source. Uh, you can test. Um, when it says platform there, basically it's saying it runs on, you, know, you can run it on Windows, Linux. OS X is Linux, of course. Um, and it basically targets the web. I should have put web REST services there also. Um, and it's open source. So. We talked a little about earlier about how Selenium interacts with the browser using the API, so that's important. Um, and, oops, um, it has a very large community community base. Um, this is that article on the open on the architecture that's really interesting. If you want to take a look at that, um, so there's really two things right now. There's there's WebDriver, which we'll talk about. And then there's the IDE. The IDE installs a plugin on your browser. You guys might have used it. And you can basically record and play. I mean, it can be good when you're learning and so you can understand. One of the most difficult things sometimes is to get the right element selectors on the page, whether you're using you know, IDs or CSS or XPath. Try to figure that out. Um, the, the IDE can be good for that if you're not that familiar with that. Um, it's not a good choice when you're designing a framework. Because when you're designing a framework, you really want to think about sort of your, your object-oriented design and how you can leverage inheritance and some of those object-oriented characteristics when you're designing your framework. Because that makes um, it a little bit more manageable and maintainable and extendable. Um, wow, wow. So that's the IDE. We talked about that, not for production automation. And this is WebDriver. So browser regression drives browsers. We talked about that. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, this is actually the hub part. So Selenium has two flavors. There's the Selenium WebDriver, which basically you can install and you can execute um, a test against a single browser in one, in one instance. The other thing you can do, they have this, they have this uh, architecture where you can provide a hub, and you can send your tests through here, and then you can run. These are these scenarios are running on different operating systems, and different um, versions of browsers. And typically, these would run on different VMs. So you would have like a, a VM uh, farm or um, Sauce Labs. Have any, anybody used Sauce Labs? Sauce Labs is a kind of a I don't know. It's a virtual environment. You can you can basically I haven't used it. Um, but you can basically take your test, put it out on Soft Labs, and you can run it against all kinds of different browsers. And you, it's, you have to pay, of course, but you can run against different versions of different browsers. So 
I've only did, I only did this at, at my first group that I was in. We actually had, uh, we wanted to test against multiple browser versions and different OS versions. And um, so we actually had VMs running in all those different operating systems. And then we wrote uh, kind of a custom application that would basically spawn a thread and then send the Selenium stuff off to those different, different clients. Um, any questions on that? It's kind of a really, a really good um, architecture that Selenium has for testing multiple browsers and different OSs. Sir. This guy? Yeah. Yep. So basically, the dri you have dri specific web drivers for specific operating systems and for specific browsers. So if you're testing IE, there's a specific Selenium web driver for IE. And there's a specific one for Firefox, specific for Safari, and specific for Chrome. And so what you would do, basically, is you um, this all these three could run in the same VM instance, and you would have all those drivers available. And then when you communicate through Selenium, so Selenium has this thing called a grid. So you, this is running, this is, you see you have one VM set up where all this stuff would be, and then there's this grid. So the grid node is basically a listener. So it's using sockets, and it listens, and it's listening for you to send it information. So then, over on your other server where you're actually executing your tests, which would sometimes be, um, I'm going back to Jenkins, and I don't know if you guys have much experience, but Jenkins, again, in the continuous integration environment, Jenkins is used to sort of monitor the source control. So if something changes in the source control, then Jenkins can be used to execute stuff. And you can tell it using the command line to execute uh, specific versions of Selenium um, on remote machines. So that's, that would be one way to do it. I mean, using Jenkins at, at the command line. You could ch basically change the, 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 um, the version of the driver. So does that make sense, kind of? Yeah. Are you guys looking at something like that, of uh, testing multiple versions of browsers? I'm just doing general. OK. Sir? Uh, for the VMs, do you get as granular as like service pack? Yeah, we don't really. I mean, we're, you know, even as bad as it sounds at Thomson Reuters, we only test Firefox. You know, and this is for a public facing application, you know, which is kind of, we actually had, we had a, one of the issues we had last couple of weeks ago was it was data related, but it was not being tested because I don't remember exactly why, but like all of Canada couldn't use our application. It was like a whole week. And we, the reason they didn't see it is because something in the nightly builds and the, regress, the continuous integration that we guys were talking about, we had shut it down because those tests were failing and we were trying to fix them. So, um, so to answer your question, I mean, you, you could manage it at that level, I think, and I think some companies do. Um, it kind of just kind of depends on the resources and all that kind of stuff. Sir? So each node would map to a VM, correct? In this, in this architecture? Yes, here. here. Yeah, like, these, like each node would map to a VM. Yeah, so you'd have a hub that, does, that takes in your tests and does the scheduling. Yep. And it submits commands to each of the VMs. The VMs would be running different operating systems or yep. service packs even. Right. And then um, from there, it would communicate to the Selenium web driver for all the installed browsers, right. and then all the information would come back through the hub, right? Well, so that's, we'll talk about that too. So Selenium basically executes, and um, in our case, we're using Cucumber. Have you guys, anyone using Cucumber? So you can use different tools kind of around Selenium. Um, Selenium can run in like um, uh, JUnit, or it can run in TestNG, and those frameworks generate like XML as your output. And that, see, that, that has to be redirected. So like for our Jenkins jobs, so we run, 
a Jenkins job that runs the execution of the test, but then that XML has to be sent back someplace so that you can generate reports on it. Um, so does that make sense? Kind of. So the information flows back through another medium. Yes. Okay. Yep. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, sir. Hi. I have a weird question. So when you use the newest version of Firefox, do you ever run into like web driver extension issues? Yes. So the well, the latest version, the latest version of the Firefox driver. You mean the web driver? Yeah, the Fox driver. Yeah, I don't know exactly the details, but the latest version of the Firefox driver, and this gets this goes to remember I mentioned earlier about how because Selenium is being labeled as a potential standard, that the browser developers, you know, i.e., Microsoft, Mozilla, uh, my, my, Apple, and Google are going to start developing the driver as part of the browser. And so one of the issues they have right now is the version of the driver is not compatible with the version of Firefox. Because the guys that are writing the drivers right now um, are, I don't know where, it's an open source, I don't know where all that happens, but they're not, they're not together. It's like the, the, the people that are writing the software for the browser are keep moving forward. And so the people that are writing the driver for Selenium have to communicate and sort of have to be in step to make sure all that happens. And that coordination doesn't happen. In fact, putting this demo together, I'll show you in a minute, you know, I had to, I went on the internet to figure out which versions of the, because it was failing for me actually here. And I had to go out, you get out, you get some kind of a socket error. I don't remember what it was. And so I went out and Googled it. And if you Google the version of um, the web driver, and then you Google the version of the browser, if you're working with Firefox, you, there's a lot of discussion about which ones, to which map to which and stuff. So I don't know. That's all I can tell you. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. So it's not just me. <laughs> no, no, it's no. a big problem. I mean, it's, you know. They seem really bad about even like putting of a supported version on the, so you, I end up on forums and there's just, it's lower yeah. and it seems, we ended up running uh, the ESR is a Firefox and yep. that greatly mitigated the problem. So okay. Yeah, no, that's cool. See, in my job, we, we do all our tests on the Chrome driver. We pretty much have no issues with that. It seems to be fairly... Yeah, bad. I've read that too, that Chrome is a little bit stable. And it might be, I know that at one time, Google, the developers at Google were actually working on the Selenium development, but I'm not really sure what that relationship is. So. There's some interesting videos out on the internet. You know, Selenium has lots of conferences, you know? And so one, one conference was really cool. They had all these guys on stage. They were all guys, sorry. And there's a guy from Microsoft there and another guy that does all the development for iOS and another guy does this and others. And they're asked, answering questions, right? And it was really funny because the questions always come to the IE because IE has tons of problems, right? And so the, the guy from Microsoft is up there or, He's not from Microsoft, but, and it was really interesting to hear his answers and listen to kind of how to talk, how the problems occur, and it's really complex because IE is a kind of a different beast, I guess. Um, so, any other questions on, on kind of this framework? We're 40 minutes. I got 10 minutes, right? 15 minutes. Okay, let's just uh, cruise in here and see. I want to see how far I am. So I'm, I'm going to talk, this is, all these slides are a little bit about the details of WebDriver. Um, I'm going to go really fast so we can get kind of to the demo piece a little bit. There's that slide again. I don't know why. So this is a good little slide on the bindings. So the WebDriver is here. You can use all these languages to write tests uh, targeting the WebDriver. And then, of course, WebDriver supports all these different browsers. Cucumber. So Cucumber has become, I don't want to say de facto standard, but it's a really good um, way to sort of manage your tests. And it uses this syntax, kind of, it's called Gherkin, I guess, um, where you say have a given when, so it's easy to read. Initially, when I saw this and was asked to write for it, I was kind of like, ugh, because the, I think the original purpose of this is to be able to pr provide your specifications to your BAs, 
And the BAs would, because it's non-technical in a way, would be able to write this and provide that as kind of a direction in writing your automation. And it never happens that way. Um, it happens a little bit, but usually the software developers, the automation developers are writing this. I'm waiting for pictures. There's a few people taking pictures. So, yep, I'll post this out, out there. I don't know where, but it'll be out there someplace. <laughs> Well, I mean, it'll be out. It'll be on the on the Mini Star. Okay. Mini Star posts all the video, like we're on TV right now, and all that stuff. Oh, okay. So it'll all be out there somewhere. So this, I'm just gonna run, skip through this stuff. This, these are all the details of Selenium as far as selecting. You can select elements. This is really important, but we only have 10 minutes, and I want to kind of go through the demo and then allow you guys to ask more questions. Um, it's how you interact with the elements on the page. Um, you can use an ID, which is ideally the best way to do it. Um, class name, XPath, uh, select tags. There's, if you look at the API for Selenium, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. So this is what I wanted to show you a little bit. So this is, we're, we'll kind of move through this too. Um, this is Jenkins. So basically, this is a tool that runs. It's open source. It runs on the internet. And again, it's monitoring your source control. Um, and it will run jobs either um, as a notification is received or it can run jobs in a scheduled basis. Um, so we're looking at, you can't read this very well, but here is, this is, a, this is my Git repository where my software is, where my source code is. And it's referenced here again. And then the next page basically shows uh, this is my command line for my test that I'm going to execute. So, for example, if I go to here, you know, this is my command line when I use uh, Maven. So, and Maven is a build tool. I don't know if you guys are using Maven, but Maven is a build tool you install. So, if I say clean install, what that will do is it'll build my build my test suite and run it. So I can do that right now. I won't do it right now. But if I go back to the presentation, if I have my test in the source control, sorry, I'm trying to find my stuff again. Um, Slideshow. So I have my test in here. And then Jenkins will get a message saying to run this. And when it's running, it will finish. And then hopefully, it'll turn green. And then you can go look at the report. Now, you'll notice over here someplace, there's Cucumber reports. So Cucumber has a plugin to Jenkins that, again, um, takes all that. Uh, there's an XML file that gets generated. And the reports look like this. So this is a really nice report. It shows you your tests in sort of an overview. And then it gives you all the details of your, um, of your test. I should skip back here really quick. Hold on. So going back to Cucumber, because it is a Cucumber plugin. So, so when you write these tests, there are scenarios, right? Here's the feature. The scenario is written. Um, given the login page and C-Track website, and I log in with my correct credentials, I log in with invalid password, I log in as a different user, and then I'm testing to make sure I can get to the home page. Okay? So you write that in Cucumber, um, and I'll show you this in a minute, but behind there is the, the code that executes Java or C Sharp. And then when you run the application in Jenkins, you get this, okay? These are your scenario, these are your features, and and if you dive in deeper into each one of those features, you get your scenarios. So this is one feature, and I opened it up, and you have the scenarios. This, they're not the same because I'm I copied this from my work, and the other one is from the presentation. But does everybody kind of get that how that syncs up? Um, so that's the end of that. So now we can go here. Um, I have a little demo. So what I did was I created 
Um, some of you guys saw this when you came in. But basically, I have a feature file here um, that has one scenario. It logs into the min star page and then clicks on sessions. So again, this is, this is Cucumber, right? And so you get a plugin for your IDE. So if you're using Eclipse, you can do this in Eclipse. You can do it in IntelliJ. And you get a, a plugin. So if I do Control B, it takes me to the implementation. OK, so this is the implementation of that step. So we were here, right? This is all written, just, it's just text. And then it takes you to, sorry, takes you to the implementation. Now, you write all this by hand. Like if I change this to like B, see I just stuck a B in there? So that breaks everything, right? So now if I go back here, see that that's broken now. It doesn't see it. If I hover over, it says, what does it say? Undefined reference, OK? So when you're designing all this, everything obviously has to be matching up. So let's see. I have to get so back like there now. Refactoring your IDE, can you do that here? Like refactor the name, and it'll change all the references? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yep. Yep, yep. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Given I'm on the home page. Now I have to fix that. How do I get back there? Do, do. So anyway, the home page. So just to lay out things here, we'll fix that this way. So basically, we're running our tests. We've got our pages here. And this is our runner. We'll talk about that in a minute. And we have all our steps. So we're running. Here's the min star. And here's min star. So we've got this kind of talks, kind of lays out a little bit page object model and designing pages. So ideally, you should create a class that is encapsulates one page or a section of an application. Like if we were writing, if we were, if this was a web page, for example, and we were writing a test for this, we would probably have a class that covers this page, and we would have a class that covers this thing, this uh, tree. And we would have a class that covers this. And then in that class, you would provide uh, access methods to these. Okay, And that's, if you look here, um, the web page, and I'll bring that up so we can see it. Uh, how are we doing on time? So how many minutes do I have? Five minutes. Seven minutes, OK. Anybody have any questions? Minstar. OK, so this is the main page, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to click here. And that's going to get us to sessions. And then once we get there, so, so basically, when you look at the code, we have this is the home page. This is providing access to the, um, the schedule element uh, using the ID. And then the uh, navigate to home page. Um, and then we've got the login page, which basically just returns um, the username and password and button to press. And then we've got the scheduled page. So those are your pages. And you'll notice that each one of those pages extends base page. And base page is basically um, providing our access to our driver. And it can get a lot more complicated than this, but this is just basic overview. Sorry, basic overview of um, of how you implement the Selenium part of it. So going back, so if I wanted to fix that little test, see there's the B. So if I get rid of that B, and we can run this test in here by doing um, clean install, and that will. Um, that will execute our test. The first thing, when you see the browser start up, that's actually um, instantiating the driver class, the web driver class. So, so there, that, that happened right there. And then it's going to start clicking through. It's going to click onto sessions. And it goes pretty fast. And it logs in. And now we're on, it's the same page, but now we're logged in on my end of it. <coughs> and then it's done. So again, all of your, all the reporting stuff, so if you look at target, so 
all of this under Cucumber. Cucumber generates um, all the data. So if you look in here and you look in here, all this is formatted. Um, let's see, where is the data? Report JS. So this, all this is the report stuff. So this stuff, when we looked at the Jenkins, remember we looked at Jenkins and you could see the graphs? So all the graphs are generated using this data that's generated from Cucumber. Am I done at 55 or 50? Um, 55, OK. Um, any other questions? Or any questions about any of this stuff? I know I went really fast at the end. Sorry about that. I know, it seems a little complicated, but you know. Question. Yep. How tedious to write cucumber, cucumber text specification? I think if you can write Selenium itself in Java, right? So what's the value of writing cucumber? Well, the value of cucumber is it's a good way to manage your data. So I didn't, I didn't provide a very good sample here because I don't have any data in my steps. So like, sorry, I'm going to go back to the feature file. So my feature file doesn't have any data, but I'm going to show you. Um, this is our application at Thomson Writers, and I'll pick a feature file here that has some data in it, step definitions. Uh, sorry. And it's a good way to manage data that's used for testing. So here's an example. So we're testing. Uh, setting bookmarks. Okay? In order to set a bookmark in our application, we have to send data using a REST service to a service, and it puts it in a database. So we're providing this data in this table. Okay? You could provide this data um, in a, some kind of an object, if you wanted to, in Java, but it makes it less maintainable. You know, this is easy to read. It's easy, it's easy to maintain. All this is stored with your test code in source control in Git or TFS, wherever. So again, at first, I was skeptical. I was kind of like, eh, you know, because I had never used this before. But then I think the more I use it and the more um, Cucumber has a really good interface with, um, with Selenium. And uh, it's a good way to maintain the data. We actually use this actually to maintain our data for our REST services also. Because if you're sending a REST service, you're creating a payload, right, before you make the REST service. So we store that data in here too. Sir, in the back. Do you find that this? Yes. It does. Yep, I would agree. And I, I think it's really important to have that structure. Um, I, I mean, again, going back to Thomson Reuters, I mean, we actually try to sort of cross pollinate a little bit. You know, some of our testers, uh, the employees, not the contractors, but the employees who are doing testing at Thomson Reuters get to do development and vice versa, you know, in an agile environment. You know, in agile, everyone's supposed to do everything, right? So that's kind of the thing. I might have to leave. So what, are we OK? I'm supposed to close my laptop and walk out of the room. That's what they say. So thanks, everybody.